pretty good understanding um, of the uh, molecular uh, and functional pathways that are involved. So in Parkinson's disease, for example, a very canonical disorder, we have a pretty good understanding of what role dopamine plays um, in the direct and indirect pathways. And based on that, we've been able to target areas like the subthalamic nucleus with devices like deep brain stimulation um, uh, to uh, fairly good effect. Um, however, there's still many disorders um, that we don't really have a very good understanding or treatment of. And these include things like uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, depression, autism, OCD. And um, autism is actually a very good um, uh, model for this. So uh, for many of us, we're pretty uh, aware of, of this disorder as a uh, social impairment. Um, oftentimes individuals um, uh, that have autism spectrum disorder have um, a preoccupation with self or difficulty in relating to others. They also have a different uh, difficulty in interpreting social cues. Uh, such as the emotions or social intentions of others. Uh, but when you actually look at the DSM um, uh, four criteria for this, it really boils down to two uh, uh, main factors. So this includes difficulty with social communication and repetitiveness uh, behavior. Uh, but as you can see from this, that there are a lot of many other aspects of this disorder that are affected. So oftentimes individuals will have mood related uh, difficulties, anxiety, oftentimes actually language uh, disability is a big uh, factor. And uh, it affects really more than a million, uh, 100 million individuals uh, worldwide. And in the United States alone here, it, it accounts for over a billion dollars per year. Um, but re remarkably, there's still no effective treatments for, for this disorder. And so um, even though we have a pretty good understanding of the genetic and synaptic mechanisms that are affected at the static level, uh, we don't really understand uh, or have a very good understanding of what are the neural encoding uh, and circuit-based mechanisms that are involved. So when you actually dynamically interact with somebody, what, what actually happens? What are the actual deficits here? And this affects, um, you know, oftentimes individuals with autism have, you know, like I mentioned, difficulty in uh, interacting with others. And so social behavior is a very complex entity. Uh, when you think about it, you're, you have to be able to uh, anticipate what somebody else is feeling or thinking. Uh, um, um, what you do doesn't affect necessarily just what your own outcome, but it also affects how others um, may respond in return. So it has this like really dynamical uh, um, uh, aspect to it that is really hard to pin down. And so one of the things we wanted to do is start getting a good understanding of uh, what are the, uh, the mechanisms underlying social behavior, what aspects are disrupted, and try to introduce a little bit more of a naturalistic approach to trying to understand this as opposed to uh, much, as, much of, of what have, has been done in the past in terms of trying to understand, you know, how are the, what anatomical pathways are affected or what synaptic mechanisms are affected. Uh, so to start with this, uh, we um, uh, honed in on one specific uh, gene as, as a primer, so SHANK3. So SHANK3 is a, is a, a gene on chromosome 22. Uh, it's uh, been uh, broadly shown to be involved in autism uh, spectrum disorder, even though it's a very heterogeneous disorder. It accounts for over a percent of individuals with, with uh, ASD. And it's uh, shown to be involved in postsynaptic scaffolding. So this is actually ubiquitous within the brain, but uh, oftentimes it does involve the prefrontal and dorsomedial prefrontal cortices that are known to be involved in social behavior. And uh, the really cool thing about this is you can actually knock it out in a mouse model and these animals will actually display social behavioral deficits. So uh, lack of interest in others. And um, if you knock out both genes, um, really bad auto automatisms. And so what it's allowed us to do is to start looking at the molecular and anatomic development, developmental aspects of this disorder. Um, but the, how this actually relates to behavior has been a little bit more of a mystery. And so to start addressing this, uh, what we did is we uh, used this, uh, combined these two genetic approaches uh, in which we essentially um, uh, uh, inverted the PDZ domain, which is the um, uh, shank free anchoring domain of the uh, protein. And we used the Crelock system that allowed us to um, uh, basically knock it out and then re-invert the PDZ domain, restore function in real time 
uh, as we're recording neural activity in these animals. So we can actually take animals that have that are developmentally shine 3 deficient and then restore it in real time and then track neural activity as we're doing this. So I'm not gonna get into too much detail about the, the, the genetic approach, but the thing that uh, is really interesting is how does encoding of social information actually evolve over time as we knock out and restore this um, gene? So to do this, we use these floating uh, multi-electron microarrays in the DMPFC. As, um, as these animals perform the basic uh, social behavioral task, we use a number of different approaches uh, for recording, to, including wireless recordings. Uh, we didn't do that specifically here. Um, but uh, as we recorded neural activity in their brain, we introduced this very basic uh, social task in which we could uh, look at three orthogonal uh, social domains. Um, so we could look at the animal's experience valence. So is there something appetitive or aversive happening? Uh, the social agency of that, uh, that experience. So is this happening to me or to somebody else? And then who am I interacting with? Is this somebody else uh, that's familiar to me or not familiar to me? So essentially, as we did this, we had two animals um, basically paired. Uh, we did a whole number of different controls that, that I won't get into into detail, uh, but we essentially alternated these, these uh, different parameters and re as we recorded neural activity from their brains. And so what we found in wild type animals is that um, in many of them, this is fairly well known, um, uh, many of the neurons responded uniquely to the animal's own experience. So are they having their own appetitive or aversive experience? And this is an example of a parasitical cystogram and raster of such a neuron. And this particular neuron responded pretty robustly to what was happening to the animal themselves, uh, but had fairly little response to what was happening to the other animal. Now, what was really interesting is we found that uh, a certain number of neurons, um, almost an equal number of neurons, actually responded fairly uniquely to what the other animal was, to, uh, the, the other animals experienced, uh, but relatively little to the animal's own. And when you actually looked at this at the level of the population, you found that those the, those are reasonably equal distribution of the two. So some of the neurons, about half, responded uniquely to self, about half responded uh, uniquely to other, and very few in between. So very few responded. Um, equally to self and other. Now, these are wild type animals. So the first question we asked is, well, what, ha what happens when you have a shank 3 deficient animal? So these are heterozygous animals. And uh, specifically, we used um, um, uh, uh, a heterozygous as opposed to a homozygous construct. The homozygous animals are, are extremely sick. They're, um, uh, they can't really truly socially interact. So it's very difficult to uh, to, to work with them. And uh, this uh, is more representative of actually what you see in humans. And so what we found interestingly is that, that there was a, a much uh, stronger representation of self uh, in, these, in these neurons. So a predominant proportion of neurons were very uniquely interested in what was happening to the animals themselves. Uh, and very few to the other animals experience. Um, the other really cool thing here is that there's essentially a complete overlap. So there's no neurons that encoded information about other that did not, did not encode information about self. So these neurons, in a certain sense, lost this ability to encode the agency of, of, of uh, self versus other to differentiate between the two. And so we did a whole number of different controls. Again, I won't go into it for the sake of time uh, to confirm that this isn't truly a social uh, a social type of encoding. So you could argue, for example, well, maybe these neurons are simply encoding the, the, the uh, stimuli themselves independently of what was happening to the other. We showed that that was not the case. Um, and so the, the next question is, well, you know, what, what is the actual um, time causal relation or what is the, 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 the actual relation between gene expression uh, these specific neural encoding properties and the animal's social behavior. So that, that was one of the links that was really missing. And so to do this, we restored shank 3 expression in these animals. Um, and what you can do is when you give tamoxifen, you can actually um, activate the, the Cree, uh, Cree enzyme. The enzyme goes into the nucleus, it reinverts the PDZ domain, it restores shank 3 expression. And you can actually follow shank 3 expression in these animals after giving them tamoxifen. 
And of course, we did a control in which we had the same Prelux system, but in which uh, there was no restoration of uh, shank free expression for control. And we showed that there was, in fact, uh, gene expression. And then we asked, well, you know, how does this affect our social behavior? Uh, so um, to do this, we start with a very basic um, uh, three chamber task. So this is essentially many of you may be familiar with this. We mice generally have a, a, a preference to hang out with another animal as opposed to an inanimate totem. And so it, it's not a massive difference. Uh, they, you know, in this case, that's about uh, slightly greater than a 10% preference to hang out with somebody else, uh, which is probably my, my baseline preference when I'm not in a bar. But, you know, these animals do have some, you know, so, some social preference that we can actually track, so we can track them. Um, uh, this is a heat map showing the, the general distribution. And then we can compare this to uh, the shank uh, three animals. And so in shank three animals, they, they don't have much of a preference. But then when you restore shank three expression, uh, interestingly, they actually get a very strong preference to hanging out with, with, a, with a, the other animal. And the really cool thing is actually, it's almost more than the wild types. Uh, so it's almost that they are you know, socially deprived and they're overcompensating uh, once you restore, uh, uh, restore the, the gene. And we did a number of different controls to, to make sure that this is not simply that they're uh, moving more, um, uh, or a motoric uh, explanation. We also looked at uh, other uh, possible compounds like anxiety-related behavior. And we, we found that this is relatively uh, specific to, to social behavior. And so the last thing that we did is we tracked their neurons. We asked, well, you know, how does the neural encoding actually change over time as you restore shank expression? And we found similarly that there's a, there a pretty robust restoration of neural encoding of self versus other. And very similar to their social behavior, we actually found that there was a, almost an overcompensation of neuron, neurons encoding information about the others, uh, uh, the others' experience compared to self. So, so the very last thing is we wanted to actually ask, well, you know, is there a, a temporal dependency between two? Between two? And we, we actually tracked their behavior over time and, uh, and their and neural encoding over time. And this was actually an immense amount of work. You had to uh, record neural activity every other day uh, from multiple mice across many weeks. Um, and what we found is that there was actually, as their um, sociability increased over time, so did their encoding of other, uh, other, others' experience and the self and other uh, related distinction. And we can actually look at the temporal dependency and you can actually see that the, that the change in neural encoding uh, precedes the change in behavior by, by about a week. And you do not see this when you do not restore shank expression. So for example, you could argue, well, you know, maybe this is just um, something that happens over time naturally and we do not see that. And so, you know, within functional neurosurgery, obviously you can't really restore a gene throughout the brain, um, but you can restore it focally. Um, so this actually took us a little while to, to, to figure out how to do, but we, we restored their uh, shank three expression also locally in the DMPFC. And what we found is that a, a fairly similar effect, which was really interesting when you think about it, these animals are shank three deficient throughout their brain. Um, but when you restore um, uh, shank three expression solely in the DMPFC, you saw uh, restoration of, of sociability and, and neural encoding in that area. And we, I can talk to you a little bit later about you know, what we think this may mean. So the DMPFC is one hub within a fairly broad social network, including the amygdala, uh, ventral prefrontal areas, uh, the insula. Uh, but we think it's a critical hub really in, 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 uh, in um, how individuals respond to social information. And we're still, we're using a number of different techniques, um, including uh, RADS to try to um, dissect the circle a little bit further. I won't go into that right now, looking at how the insula interacts with the DMPFC uh, bidirectionally um, and try to understand how is it that this one restoring uh, neural encoding, this one area is able to change uh, behavior so, so markedly. Now, again, it doesn't necessarily reverse other phenotypes like anxiety-related behavior or automatisms, which are thought to be more basic ganglia related and, and um, related to other areas. There, there's also really interesting research uh, coming about about the, the role that the cerebellum actually plays in this, in this type of behavior. 
So th this is, again, you know, a really immense amount of work done by, by a truly talented group of individuals, including Gabriel Friedman. He's uh, also currently in uh, neurosurgery, uh, Dan Lee and Ferris Spoonie. And so what we think we've been able to do is identify uh, some of the neurons that, that, um, that are responsible for encoding information about self and other, and, um, and how their encoding may be related to autism-related behavior. Uh, and the really interesting and cool thing is that uh, we think we've been able to show to a certain degree that you can, that uh, autism-related pathology may be potentially restorable post-developmentally in adult cortical neurons. Uh, and so that gives us a little bit of a hook and hope that this may be something that could be potentially restored in, in, a, in adults and humans. And so... Sorry, Zeev. So, yeah, Sorry, go ahead. Kate Watkins asking, what is it much you've been doing, all these male and female mice? So say, um, so say that one more time. What is tamoxifen been doing? Are these male and female mice? Yeah, so these are male mice. Uh, so uh, we, we haven't um, uh, done this in females and we are actually starting to look at um, uh, things like competitive behavior in males and females, but it's a good question. So one question is, you know, is tamoxifen simply, you know, causing some effect uh, on behavior itself? And that for that reason, we actually replicated everything. So for example, this slide here, um, everything is exactly the same. Tamoxifen is given to these animals uh, and they have the same Prelux system, but uh, they don't, uh, this does not allow shank three expression to be restored. And so tamoxifen in itself is not actually causing anything to the behavior of the animals. Uh, but, um, uh, and I can kind of go back to the slide. So what tamoxifen uh, does here, um, is it will attach to uh, a receptor on the Crelex enzyme, and that will let the Cre enzyme enter the nucleus and re-invert the PDZ domain and restore shank three expression. So we're using it basically as, a, as an agent to restore shank three expression through this Crelex system, uh, which are essentially flocks here. Um, but tamoxifen in itself does not, you know, is not doing anything to, to the animal's behavior. It's a good question about females, though, uh, and it's, you know, some that you may see an independent different effect uh, if you do it in females, but we haven't done that. So, um, so that kind of brings us to, to the next question. So, you know, um, you know, there are a lot of things you can do in mice, so you can, you um, um, uh, uh, look at gen uh, uh, genetically modified animals, even though you can, you can that there are some groups that are starting to do this in primates, uh, but still their social behavior is fairly basic. Uh, and there are a lot of things that doesn't really recapitulate how, you know, higher primates or humans um, uh, really behave. So uh, within primates and, and humans, we, we kind of like dynamically interact uh, naturalistically with others. Uh, there are a lot of things that you can ask about, you know, how social decisions are made in, in, in these animals, uh, like action predictions, things like theory of mind, uh, higher level uh, cognitive processes. And so in primates, you know, social interactions are incredibly, incredibly complex, um, but um, economic game theory, for example, allows you to distill these really complex interactions into its very basic elements. And so some of you may be very familiar with, with uh, uh, economic game theories like uh, the prisoner's dilemma game. And this is a really interesting game because it, it, it essentially involves two individuals uh, and they have really two very basic choices. Do I cooperate with somebody or do I defect? And so based on these really basic uh, elements, um, you can start dissecting and, and asking very interesting questions. So for example, if two individuals cooperated, they would get the highest mutual amount of reward. Uh, but the, the dilemma here is that if one individual defects and the other decides to cooperate, the one that defects actually gets by far the highest amount and the one that tries to be a good person and cooperate gets the least amount. Uh, but the linchpin here is really also that if both individuals defect, then they will get a much lower amount compared to when they both cooperate. So the interesting thing here is that uh, when you set it up in that way, outcome is really contingent on the interaction between uh, two individuals. So no one decision can guarantee an individual's reward, unlike many of you know, other behaviors that we, we, we do come like day to day. And both decisions can be either concordant or discordant. So based on this very simple paradigm, you can start dissecting elements related to 
the animal's own decision, the other's decision, um, and you know their outcomes and the interaction between the two. And so here to start asking this question, what we did is we had two pr primates basically perform an iterated version of the prisoner's dilemma game. So they sat side by side and they could each choose to cooperate or defect. Now, the key here is that neither one of them knew what the other animal uh, decided until both made their choices. And again, we did a whole number of different controls I won't get into to confirm that, you know, they really could not pick up on the other's decisions uh, or choices until they were made. Uh, we also did a number of different uh, social versus non-social controls. Um, but at the very basic level, what we found when recording from the DMPFC is that um, certain neurons really did respond uniquely to when the animals themselves decided to cooperate or, or defect. Um, but really interestingly, we found that um, many, uh, many of the neurons actually responded uniquely to when the others uh, decided to cooperate or defect. Now, the thing that's not intuitive here, and this is a pretty stimulus histogram and raster of this, is that the other animal's choice did not happen up to almost a second afterwards. So these neurons were uniquely predicting what the animal, other animal was gonna do before they did it. Um, and so the, the cool thing is you can actually also look at the population response. And this is a, a, um, a PCA basically looking at all the neurons recorded simultaneously for an individual monkey when the other animal cooperated or defected. And this is a projections of the discriminant component from a, from a Fisher discriminant. And these are essentially the projections for individual trials where the animals predicted correctly based on neural activity what the other animal was going to do before they did it. And when you compile all this, um, the uh, prediction accuracy was, was actually reasonably high. So it was around 80% uh, correct. Um, and when you actually compared it to the optimal uh, behavior that you can predict based on the an other animals' past behavior and the mutual interactions, we did a number of different things, um, uh, you know, like GLMs and uh, uh, regression models. And we found that consistently that almost the most that you can predict was about 80% uh, or slightly higher. So, so even with this fairly limited number of neurons, you could almost optimally predict uh, what the other animal uh, was going to do, which was really interesting. And so that, that kind of like brings us more to you know, the, the broader question. Um, so uh, when, when we interact, we often interact within you know, large groups. And the, this is really naturalistically what many of us do, both you know, in primate societies, often are made out of many, many individuals that need, where they need to uh, you know, understand who did what to whom and how. Uh, we as individuals, you know, we communicate with many others. We, we have these really broad social networks. And so the, the computations that are involved are not simply, you know, is, you know, is this me or anybody else, but it's really, you know, who am I specifically interacting with? Uh, you know, group behavior has a lot to do with economic and, and social behavioral theory. Um, by looking at groups, it also start, it allows you to start asking questions about, you know, social identity, like who am I specifically interacting with? Uh, it, it, it lets you start asking questions like, you know, reciprocity and reputation. Uh, what are others, you know, in the group collectively specifically doing? And it lets you start mimicking some of the thing, uh, some of the elements that are more relevant to, to natural human behavior. So, so this is kind of what we did. And that's, we've been working on this for the last you know, five years or so. And it was in, incredibly actually a hard thing to, to, uh, to do uh, for any of you who, who've you know, ever played with primates. Um, and so what we converged on is this um, setup where we essentially had three primates uh, sitting around a rotary table. And at different trials, uh, one, of the monkey, uh, one of the animals could offer reward to one of the others. Now, the interesting thing here, though, is that it's it's even though it's deceptively simple, it lets you ask really interesting questions. So, for example, if monkey three gave reward to monkey two, monkey two may be you know very happy and may reciprocate and give reward back to monkey three. 
But, you know, it could be that monkey one gets really annoyed and, you know, how come I didn't get the reward? And he may retaliate by giving reward to monkey two as well. But then you get this wealth disparity uh, and you can actually look at things like Gini coefficients, like the wealth distribution across the group. And so, you know, monkey two may be getting over reward and this may create this imbalance. So, you know, even, even though this is a fairly, you know, simple paradigm, it lets you start asking really complex questions. And so we also did a number of different controls to <clears throat> disambiguate the, the direction of movement from who is actually specifically getting reward. Uh, we also uh, changed the other animals' locations to uh, disentangle the, the spatial aspects of um, where the other animals are sitting. And we also uh, randomly changed the sequence of who was the actor, who was getting reward and who was receiving it. So as we did this, we also recorded from the DMPFC. And the first thing that we ask is, you know, does their behavior actually make sense? And you can actually track their behavioral dynamics over time. And <clears throat> again, without getting into, into too much detail, we showed that the animals actually did behave, um, uh, uh, you know, appropriately in terms of uh, their um, uh, reciprocation, retaliation, uh, things like tit for tat behavioral strategies. Um, and that you know those behaviors were, were largely um, uh, absent when they when they did not uh, uh, play with other social agents. So the um, the first thing that we started to ask is well you know what are the neurons doing in the DMPFC as they're playing these uh, uh, playing this uh, uh, game? And so you know the two things we found, which is somewhat consistent with what we've already shown before, is that. Um, uh, many of these neurons encoded information about what the animal themselves were doing as well as whether any other animal was, was um, doing it. So these are two particular neurons that responded simply to whether the animal themselves received reward or any of the other animals. But the really interesting thing is that we found that a certain fraction of neurons actually responded very uniquely to whether uh, a specific other animal received reward. So this particular neuron did not simply uh, care about whether any other animal received reward, but specifically whether one of these animals received reward and displayed relatively little difference in response to, to any other. So this, this was actually really surprising, but also really cool. So these types of neurons have been you know, really theorized and have thought to be essential for our ability to interact effectively with others because they're, um, you know, encoding not only information about um, uh, anybody else um, or simply the identity of uh, somebody else, but, you know, who, who is specifically interacting with whom and how. And so you can actually track these neurons. So when, uh, one of the first questions would be, are, are these neurons simply responding to uh, simply, you know, any other uh, individual or any other location? And so we can actually switch these animals so we could switch our locations, we found that these types of neurons actually tracked the other animals specifically. Um, we also showed that these neurons did not simply respond to the identity of the others in, in, independently of their interactions. So we also did a control task in which the animals could simply view one of the other two animals. And we showed that these neurons <clears throat> did not simply respond simple, uh, similarly to facial, uh, facial representation type of neurons like you'd find uh, in the fusiform uh, face area. And we also looked at um, non-social interactions um, and we found that these neurons didn't respond uh, accordingly. And so, um, so this was, you know, it was really interesting that when you actually glued all these neurons together and I'm kind of like just showing you a little bit of, of, the, of the data, uh, we found neurons that encoded information about who the actor was. Uh, we found neurons that encoded information who the recipient was. And we actually modeled all of these together. You could actually paint a really rich representation of who was interacting with who and how. And the really cool thing is that some of these neurons could actually encode information about uh, interactions that are purely happening between two other individuals. So uh, if this animal was the one being recorded, for example, uh, and monkey two and monkey one were interacting with each other, these neurons could also include, you know, the directional, directionality of those interactions. So was monkey one giving reward to monkey two? Was two giving it to, to one? And in combination, you could actually really kind of get a, a good representation of the dynamics within the group based on this relatively <clears throat> small 
population of neurons. And um, so also without getting into too much detail about this, I'll, we also did perturbation experiments and we showed that if you perturb this area under this paradigm, you can actually very specifically um, uh, perturb uh, the, the ability of the animals to uh, interact effectively or mutually beneficially with in individual animals as opposed to simply any behavior. So any ability to, to uh, act appropriately. Um, um, so, so this kind of gave some credence to, to, to these findings. And so, in, uh, so, so again, this, this, is a, you know, this is a really challenging uh, set of experiments to do. And um, if, if any of you have children and have ever tried to put the, your three children in a, an arrangement like this and try to have them interact mutually cooperatively together at the same time, you, you'd be amazed how hard that could be. And in primates especially, it's really, really challenging. Um, and so this took us a while to do, and this is thanks to an incredibly talented postdoc, Armando Bas Mendoza, in, in lab, um, uh, who's currently actually moving to, to Germany, who's, who's uh, interested in recruiting uh, students to his lab in Göttingham, uh, and uh, Amy Wang and Emma Mastropista. And um, so what we think, you know, based on these experiences, we've been able to identify runs that encode information about specific agents within the group and their types of behavior. And it provides a, a tentative mechanism that could allow individuals to potentially <clears throat> not simply track the identity of other individuals, but uh, uh, track their specific behaviors and their interactions within groups. Uh, and it gives us a little bit of a, of a primate model that allows us to start testing these uh, types of behaviors um, uh, which are, again, relevant to, to many uh, aspects of social and economic um, uh, theory. So th this kind of <clears throat> brings us to the last, last question. And so, you know, how, how does this all occur in, in humans? Um, and so, you know, humans are, are incredibly complex. So, you know, we're, we're able to construct this in extremely complex and detailed understanding of, of reality and you know, other individuals within it, um, others' beliefs uh, or intents. Uh, we also use language to, to communicate. Um, so you know, as a very simple example, you, you may hear something like you and Tom are drinking coffee at the table. When Tom goes to the restroom, he places coffee mug under the chair. So somehow you're, you're able to take all these you know, linguistic elements, glue them together and build this like really detailed and complex representation of what's happening in your head. But I can also add this question, like when he returns, where will Tom expect to find the mug? So even though you yourself know that the mug is uh, under the chair, you will also be able to predict that Tom still thinks that it is on the table. So this ability to um, make inferences about another's internal hidden beliefs and to also distinguish between my beliefs and another's is called theory of mind. And this is oftentimes, you know, significantly affected in individuals with, with autism. And um, th there is some recent debate about what aspects of language and true uh, theory of mind are affected in, in individuals with autism. But, but it is, you know, something that we oftentimes see. Um, and so the question is, you know, how do these really complex representations come about? And so, you know, that it's a tough question to, to answer, but you can start addressing it at a very basic level. Uh, and within functional neurosurgery, oftentimes we do have access to parts of the DMPFC that we're recording during um, uh, functional neurosurgical procedures and in individuals that we're doing things like uh, deep brain simulating electrodes. Uh, and, and so it gives us a brief window to record neural activity in these areas as individuals are performing these brief, brief behavioral tasks. And so a very canonical example of, of a task that's oftentimes used to, to probe for, for theory of mind is the false belief task. And so um, in this case, you, you can ask individuals, um, provide them with a narrative and uh, then ask them a question about it. And you can vary it subtly, either the questions or the narratives themselves to uh, alternate between beliefs that are either false or true. And so based on this, fairly simple paradigm, you can take these really diverse um, uh, narratives and questions and boil them down to these, these fairly basic elements and start asking questions like, well, are there certain neurons in the human DMPFC 
that that respond uniquely or distinctly when you're just simply thinking about somebody else's thoughts. And so you can ask a question uh, or you can provide the narrative like you and Tom see pencil on the desk. After Tom leaves, you move the pencil to the drawer. Um, uh, or you can ask a question like, uh, or give a narrative uh, like you take a picture of a pencil on the desk. After taking the picture, you move the pencil to the drawer. So in, under both cases, there's a pencil, it's being moved. But in one case, when, when you ask a question, you can ask, it about somebody else's belief, but you can also ask it about the state of the pencil itself independently of somebody else's belief. Now, the, the more important question though is, you know, are there certain nouns that, you know, respond or encode information uniquely about the content of the other, other's belief? So you can also make variations where you ask the exact same question. So where does Tom think the pencil is? But you can also vary it under conditions when there's a falsehood or truth. So you can say th things like you and Tom see a pencil on the desk, after Tom leaves you sharpen the pencil, or after Tom leaves you move the pencil to the drawer. So in both cases, again, you're asking the same question, but in one that belief is true and the other it's false. And so what we found is that certain neurons did distinguish between these. They did distinguish between whether the other's belief was true or false. You can actually um, model these and ask, well, how well can you predict these? And when you actually use the uh, population decoding, the, the decoding performance was reasonably good for this. Um, now, now, obviously, you know, you want to disentangle a few different questions. So you, you can argue, well, you know, maybe this neuron simply responds to any truth or any falsehood or any uh, disparity between the current and past state of reality. So you can also ask, you know, introduce narratives where there's simply an object that changed in location or that there's a disparity uh, or, or sorry, not a disparity, but a, um, a distinction between uh, present and past events. And we found that most of these neurons were uniquely responding to either uh, uh, the other's beliefs or to simply more of a basic physical representation. And there's very little overlap between the two. Um, you could also, you know, that, the, the really cool thing about language is you can make also these very subtle manipulations in the narrative to, to change, you know, what the other's belief was. And so you can do things like um, uh, make a subtle change like you and Tom see pencil on the desk after Tom leaves, you move the pencil to the drawer as Tom watches through the window. So here things are, you know, virtually the same, but because Tom is watching through the window, their belief currently is not false anymore, it's true. And what we saw is that these neurons actually track these subtle variations. So they would actually track whether another's belief was true or false based on their awareness of reality. Um, and so you could do all these other really cool manipulations that I'm not gonna get into. We could actually like delve into, delve deeper into what are the actual items that the, the, the individual was thinking about? Was it a pencil? Was it an apple? Was it a a mug, uh, we can kind of combine them into these different categorical representations. And we could start asking questions about, you know, how finely detailed can do these neurons actually track uh, the other's beliefs. And we were actually surprised when you actually combined all these neurons together, they, they actually uh, had a really detailed and rich representation of, of the other's beliefs. Um, now, clearly, these neurons are not working in isolations. They're, you know, they're presumably communicating with other areas like the TPJ uh, and other temporal or prefrontal areas to, to build these really complex representations. So what we think these neurons are doing is that they're providing a readout of these, of these critical elements that, that are representing uh, the other's beliefs. And so, so this kind of brings us to the very last question and something that we've been super, super interested in um, and uh, so, you know, one of the things that humans can, can do that animals generally cannot do is, is language. And language, you know, it's, it's a really complex thing when you think about it. Uh, so somehow, you know, as I'm talking to you right now, um, you're able to kind of extract these, you know, really complex, you know, phonetic acoustic elements from the air, put them together, kind of combine them into these lexico-semantic representations, uh, that have meaning and then glue those together into these sentences and put them all together in your head to try to figure out what it is that I'm, I'm saying. And so in part of the brain, that's um, um, 
uh, within the left frontotemporal network um, that we oftentimes do have access to when recording neural activity is, is not to also be involved in language uh, perception. And so, you know, as, as individuals are processing these sentences, what one of the things we're very interested in trying to understand is how, you know, how do these neurons respond to these, you know, complex um, meaning representations? And so, for example, when you hear the child bent down to smell the rose, how does this actually manifest uh, at the level of neurons? So, you know, when, when we talk, we use hundreds and thousands of words, and it's, you know, not simple to simply ask, well, you know, does, does a certain neuron respond to the word dog and absolutely nothing else? But you can, you can use these um, uh, um, uh, data sets uh, where they basically um, take the, uh, create these vectoral representations of words. Uh, so you can take these really large corpora and you can actually vectorize these individual words based on their contextual similarities or how they, how they show up in, in natural language. Uh, and you can use things like word to vec or glove, um, uh, not different natural language processing models that allow you to actually quantify these. And you can actually uh, do a, a very basic dimensional reduction approach where you, where you cluster these into do semantic domains. So for example, things like sun, rain, and clouds can refer to natural phenomena, uh, but things like bunny, lizard, and horse refer to animals. And you can start asking questions like, how do neurons you know, respond to these, these uh, kind of semantic representations? And so what we found is that uh, certain neurons responded fairly uniquely to certain words. So this particular neuron, for example, responded uniquely to, to words that uh, reflected uh, uh, like people or family, family members. So things like aunt, dad, sister, son. Um, but other neurons responded much more uniquely to emotional states. So this is a pretty similar to Hizagam and Rastra for, for a neuron that responded whenever it heard the word, uh, words like happy, afraid, hurt, good. Uh, and you can actually create a coincidence matrix and ask, you know, how, how unique are these neurons? Uh, how uniquely do, do, do they respond to these, to these semantic domains? And so, so many of them actually responded fairly uniquely to, to things like nature, spatial temporal uh, representations, actions, uh, things like uh, food items. Um, and many of them were responded fairly uniquely to, to some categories and not others. And so you can actually calculate the selectivity index and ask how finely tuned are they to these, to these particular uh, semantic domains. Uh, you can also, you know, um, uh, uh, map these neural responses on um, uh, onto the um, uh, onto a common embedding space, um, and uh, if you actually regress neural activity onto the model uh, onto the embeddings, uh, you can create the you can uh, estimate the modeled weights that describe these words, and then you can project them back into uh, PC space. And you can actually ask, well, how does the brain represent cloud compared to dad? And you can use a agglomerative hierarchical clustering procedure. We actually also ask, well, how are they structurally represented? So, you know, how do things like aunt, dad, sister, son relate to other things like animals or to food items? And the really interesting thing is that we found that um, many of these kind of actually made intuitive sense. So uh, things like family members <clears throat> uh, oftentimes related very closely to names. Uh, and these in combination related fairly closely to animals, which kind of made sense for both, you know, they're all living uh, beings. And, but these are very distant from things like natural phenomena, like, you know, sunny clouds, uh, snow and breeze. And the, the last thing you could actually do is you can collapse this into a two dimensional manifold and ask, well, how's this represented in, 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 uh, in the brain at the whole level of the population? And th this is kind of like cool when you actually looked at the individual words. Again, not all of them made intuitive sense. We're, we're sampling from a fairly small population of neurons in the brain in a, per in a particular area within the frontal temporal network. Um, but this is how it looked like. Uh, and, you know, again, many, much of it kind of made intuitive sense. Things uh, like family members kind of glued together, animals glued together. And these were fairly distant from other things uh, like spatial temporal relations or actions. So, um, you know, these are things that are still in progress. We're just starting to look at these, uh, but, you know, obviously don't just listen to words in isolation. You, you listen to them uh, within kind of these very complex sentences. So, for example, Sarah paints a drawing of a red tree house in the backyard. 
we can actually start asking questions about, you know, are there certain neurons that respond uniquely to the, the, um, the, um, uh, the linguistic dependencies between these words, how they all connect, uh, and without getting into, again, too much detail, we, we've been using natural language processing models like GPT-2. Uh, There's even GPT-3 that just came out uh, or LSTM models and different kinds of uh, 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 BERT models that, that allow you to actually uh, model these things and actually look at how these neurons map onto particular uh, layers within these like uh, uh, transformer type network models. Um, and so we're just starting to dig into this, uh, but these are really interesting questions. And so it kind of speaks to um, you know, how we can take these naturalistic type approaches to start as, uh, asking questions about you know, how do um, animals and, and humans uh, approach this really complex social information. When you think about it, language is truly a social tool. There's no real good purpose for language aside from communicating information between you and I. Um, and so, you know, th there are a lot of really interesting studies uh, more recently in functional MRI studies showing a, a, you know, a fairly significant overlap between language related areas and social related areas, which kind of makes sense. So I'm going to skip. Um, uh, so again, th this was done also by an incredibly talented group of individuals, including uh, Ben Grannon, who's, who's currently a neurosurgeon, uh, a functional neurosurgeon at, at the University of Washington, Mosin Jamali, who's an instructor here. And um, I'm going to skip some of the other things that we've been really interested in in functional neurosurgery and trying to kind of understand social behavior and trying to modulate it. Um, but um, I just wanted to leave some uh, some room for for questions um, and, and some insights and you know where to take these kinds of uh, questions uh, further uh, using like naturalistic type approaches to studying social co cognition. Um, but, but at a very broad scale, uh, you know, this kind of paints a, a, a very uh, broad view of what we're trying to do in terms of trying to develop a systematic approach for functional neurosurgery, where you start at a very basic uh, molecular and genetic level up to the level of individual neurons using animal models and, and ultimately trying to understand human behavior. And my son is just turning into a teenager, so specifically understanding teenager behavior, which is a complete mystery. And so, you know, we think this has uh, application to other, um, to understanding other diseases uh, such as ADHD, depression, OCD, anxiety. And uh, like I mentioned before, a lot of these elements are involved in social behavior as well. So again, you know, this was done by an, uh, worked by an incredibly talented group of individuals. I I'm so lucky to be with them in lab. It's just a complete pleasure, you know, every day. Uh, to, to uh, uh, be in lab and just hang out. I don't have my own personal distant office. I kind of hang out with lab, in lab with everybody else and just hang out and we go out and have fun. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to, you know, to, uh, to be invited here. Um, uh, I, I'm a big fan of much of your work. Um, and so um, uh, I, I'll leave this open to some questions. Uh, hopefully we have enough time. Thank you very much, Steve. It was extraordinary talk. Um, so, sure, there will be questions, but people take a little bit of time to ask the question. So, before that, can I ask a question myself? So, in in the last part, the language part, 